So let's jump into the recording here and um, talk about the heart valves because we are going to talk, hopefully we have time, and, and if not, that's no problem because we'll talk about it on Wednesday. Uh, I want to talk about the, uh, the heart cycle, like what happens, how the heart moves blood through all the chambers and out, all right? Blood comes in, blood comes out. So uh, if we have time today, we'll talk about it. If not, no worries. We'll uh, talk about it on Wednesday. Um, so keep in mind, our heart valves, their purpose and their function is to prevent backflow, ensuring that blood only travels in one direction. So a couple things, okay? In this picture here, we're gonna talk about the top two here first, okay? So in the top two atrial ventricular valves here, these pictures, you see, okay, that the valve is open here and blood is going to move from the atrium into the ventricle. So when the valve is open, you need to understand this concept because we're going to revisit it. As it moves from the atrium into the ventricle, all right, that means that in order for this valve to be pushed open, the pressure in the atria has to be greater than the pressure in the ventricle. Has anyone ever walked through a kitchen door that swings, you know, that just and then goes back to the side? Think of your heart valves like that door going into the kitchen, except it can only move in one direction. It can only go one way. It's either open or closed. If it's open, it's only open in one direction, into the ventricle. It can never go back into the atria. If it does, that's a pathology. Okay, and that's a problem, okay? So in order for that to happen, just like when you go to push open, like if that door wasn't closed all the way, but it was just, it wasn't latched. If you go to push it open, okay, and it moves into this room, the force, you are putting more pressure on that door, all right, in the direction forcing that door into this room. Same thing here when it comes to the atrial ventricular valve. When they open, they only go in one direction, and that's because the pressure in the atria is greater than the pressure in the ventricle. Same type of scenario when we're dealing with our semilunar valves, okay? Those are the valves in between the ventricles and the great vessels, okay? The arterial vessels there, okay? So, in this picture, we see as blood is leaving the ventricle, it's moving up into the uh, one of the great vessels here, all right? So, as it's opened up, all right, the pressure in the ventricle is greater than the pressure in here. Then when the valve closed, you can see, all right, you have these nice cusps here, all right? Part of the closure of the valves is the blood will start to slide back down. And because they're hooked like this, like a soup ladle, that forces, that helps to force the valves to close, okay? And also due to the pressure, okay? All right, let's jump into some labeling here. And Hannah, we're gonna get into uh, the uh, marginal artery here uh, in a moment, okay? So this view here, wait, I wanna make sure I got the right one, hold on. We'll come back, yep, 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 that one's a hot mess. This one's way better. Okay, the next slide is the exact same slide as here, okay? so. Let's go in number order. This blue structure here is the inferior vena cava. We are looking up through the bottom of the heart. The inferior vena cava goes into the right atrium here, okay? You see over here, number nine, that's the descending aorta, all right? But we can see, looking at these blood vessels here, all right, in the um, coronary sulcus here, wrapping around here underneath the, uh, along the base here of the heart, we can see we have our small cardiac vein right through here, okay? And then, all right, you have our other uh, blood vessels here on the base of the, of the heart here, or the bottom portion of the heart, I should say, all right? You can see we have the middle cardiac vein here and also next to it, it's paired with the posterior interventricular artery, all right? So over here is the right ventricle, here is the left ventricle here. So both of these artery and vein are paired. So we have the posterior interventricular artery paired with 
our middle cardiac vein, right? And they both sit in the posterior interventricular sulcus. A sulcus is a space, okay? So make sure that you read the test question, all right? And again, normally what it'll do is if it's pointing at a blood vessel and you see in parentheses red or blue, you know it's a blood vessel, okay? You don't see that. All right, make sure it's not pointing at a blood vessel, but if you see it's pointing in this area here, all right, then it's going to be the sulcus. Okay. Um, all right, here we can see all right, our posterior cardiac vein right here. And on another model, we'll, we'll look at it, but this right here is going to be the right marginal artery. All right. There's another spot that we'll see it better. So, and then over here, we've got our left atrium. And what did I miss one? Oh, and the coronary sinus is kind of, all right. The coronary sinus is going to drain right into the right atrium. I got another view here. I don't like that one. All right. We'll call, we'll keep labeling. I got the, uh, the labeling slides scattered throughout the PowerPoint. Okay. All right. So what I'm about to talk about for the next two slides or next three slides should be reviewed to you. So I won't be going into this in too much detail. Okay, but when we talk about the cardiac muscle, that's one of our three tissue types for muscle tissue. Okay, All right. One, you need to know where this type of cardiac tissue is located in the myocardium, which is that middle layer of the heart wall. All right. So our cardiac muscle cells, let me say this before, looks like a Y on its side. They branch. Okay. They're not going to be nearly as long as the skeletal muscle cells. Skeletal muscle cells are long and striated. Cardiac muscle cells are short and striated, and they branch. Okay, They'll have one to two nuclei. You already know this. All right? But it sits on top of this areolar connective tissue, all right, which is part of the inner layer of your heart. Remember, the heart is made up of three layers. The outer layer is the, the epicardium, the middle layer is the myocardium, the inner layer is the endocardium, okay? So the areolar connective tissue is part of that. We refer to that as the endomyosin there, okay? So our cardiac heart cell, quick picture of it. Wait, no, it's not that. There we go. You can see how it's branching, okay? And it's striated because it's striated because it has, all right, our myofilaments. Remember the actin and myosin, the cross bridging, okay? So we have all those uh, characteristics of the, the, the sarcomeres. Same thing here, okay? So a couple terms that you need to kind of refresh your brain with, all right? We call the plasma membrane to this muscle cell sarcolemma, okay? Same thing that we called for skeletal muscle. And all throughout the sarcolemma, there's holes. Much like if you've taken a bath and you get out of the bathtub and you watch as the water's draining out of the tub at the very end, it makes a little whirlpool over the drain. That's what those, those, those invaginations are. They're basically right, like a whirlpool kind of shaped structure. And those are called the T-tubules. Okay, so here, if we're looking at the side, here's your sarcolemma. And then you get a T-tubule that just goes down in that. Because remember, our action potential runs across the top of the sarcolemma, and then it goes down into the T-tubule. Right? And then the T-tubule, you have the, the voltage-gated calcium channels that will open up and release calcium that's in the endoplasmic reticulum. But guess what? The endoplasmic reticulum right, of cardiac muscle cells is not called the endoplasmic reticulum. We give it another name. Okay, we call that the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and the sarcoplasmic reticulum is basically this tubular network. Okay, it's a bunch of these tubes that sit on top of what we call the myofilaments, okay, which are the sarcomeres. I'll show you a quick picture here. All right, this is what we're looking at here. All right, so here, this long structure here, all right, that is going to be, all right, your myofilament. And what's a myofilament? It's just a bunch of sarcomeres stacked on one, uh, 
from end to end to end. We just took a bunch of sarcomeres mirrors and stacked them along, all right? And made this long tube, and that's a myofilament. And that's the part of the muscle cell that contracts, okay? So, and then we put around that myofilament, we put the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Because in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, that's where our calcium sits, okay? It sits there. And once an action potential comes down and depolarizes the cell, then it releases the calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and it goes into the myofilaments. Okay? And that is going to be where our sarcomeres are, where we have our actin and myosin. That's what we'll do the cross bridging and all that. You learned that all at 210. Okay? But this is the one that I really want you to understand this last part right here. Okay, this was a concept. I don't know how well your previous instructor, I'd like to think that I emphasized it enough, but I don't know. Okay, but you have to understand that when we're talking about the myofilaments with the sarcomeres and the amount of overlap between these actin and myosin myofilaments is, all right, when you want to have the most effective type of heart contraction, we want to have what's called maximum overlap. Okay. And that occurs as the heart chambers are filling up. So as the heart is filling up, it's like taking, has anyone here ever filled up a water balloon before? You know how when you fill it up with water, it stretches out? Well, that's what happens to the heart wall, okay? So as that water balloon is filling with water, well, as the water balloon is filling with water, much like that, the heart, as it's filling with blood, okay, we start to stretch the heart wall. And that causes an overlap between those filaments, okay? So when we get to a certain amount of, of filling, we get that optimal length because we've achieved that maximum overlap. And that occurs when the blood is filling up the heart chambers, okay? Okay, questions about that? All right, one more, uh, just quick review here. All right, so this part here, when we talk about this intercellular structure, remember the intercalated discs? They were these dark lines that we saw, okay? Uh, right here. I thought I had a microscopic slide on here, but I don't think I do. Oh yeah, I do, hold on, sorry. There we go. See these guys right here, these dark lines? Those are the intercalated discs. And in case you didn't remember what they were, all right, the intercalated discs all right, are made up of two things, desmosomes and gap junctions, okay? So desmosomes are actually going to be like the physical attachments that hold all right, these cardiac muscle cells in place with one another. So their job all right, the desmosomes are going to increase the structural stability of myocardium. And by doing that, all right, the effectiveness of a contraction is that much better. So by sewing, I, I, that's what I look at desmosomes are. They're like taking a button, so how it sewed the pants. That's what the, these desmosomes do. They sew these my, these, these um uh, cardiac muscle cells to one another. It stabilizes them. So when they contract, all right, the effectiveness of the contraction is all the more, okay? The gap junctions are basically holes in between these cells. And what that does is that allows ions to flow across like sodium, potassium, all right? It allows these ions to, to, to flow across these cells to help increase what we call communication between the cells. It allows that nerve signal to move across the cells so the cells can contract much more effectively and in sync with one another. So basically these gap junctions create this phenomenon that we call functional syncytium. And that allows each chamber of the heart, remember there's four, two atria, two ventricles, to effectively contract as one functional unit, okay? 
That's huge because if you think about it, how many millions of muscle cells are in each chamber of the heart? Well, we got to get them to contract at the same time. We have to get both atria to contract at the same time and both ventricles, right? Getting one whole atria to contract on its own at the same time is quite a feat. Getting two to contract in synchronicity with one another, that's huge. And we have to keep doing that, right? How many times does your heart beat in a minute? Anywhere from 60 to 100 beats on average 80. You know, I'd like to keep it lower in the 60s, if not 50s. But point being is think about that. How many minutes are in a day? Okay. So those, those uh, contractions have to be in unison. So it's these desmosomes and these gap junctions that allow that to occur. So if you see here, we'll zoom in and we'll see, all right, as we're looking at our cardiac muscle cells. Now what we've done is we've peeled away all right, the intercalated disc, and if you zoom in, these little guys right here, those are your desmosomes, and those attach, all right, the cardiac muscle cells to one another, okay, so they're like almost like an anchor, and then you can see here are the gap junctions, and at the center of them, all right, are these holes, and that allows the ions that we need, all right, for depolarization and repolarization to occur, so we can get an effective contraction in the heart. All right, so again, just to kind of review here, all right, a lot of this should be, uh, you remember this, I won't get into the H zone and the Z disc and all that, all right, but you can see how we have alternating dark and light areas, that's what's going to give our, our cardiac muscles that striated look, all right, but here is one whole, um, uh, where's the Z disc at, yeah, all right, from here, to the other Z disc, here we go. Here's one whole sarcomere, okay? And so inside is where we have those contractile actin and myosin filaments, right? But on the outside here, here is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's where the calcium is, okay? So when the heart's not beating, it's not contracting, the calcium's gonna be in there, okay? And there's a couple differences, and we'll get into it uh, when we get into the actual heart chapter in lecture. And then here's the T-tubule, okay? The T-tubules are attached to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when that action potential comes down through depolarization, it's going to release the calcium. It's going to enter into the sarcomere, right? And it's going to lead to the cross bridging, okay? If you're not sure, go back and review your notes from 210, okay? We don't have time to do it now. We've got so much more to talk about. So this leads us to why, all right, our heart needs, you've, I'm sure you've heard of a myocardial infarction, heart attack, okay? And a lot of that is because, all right, a heart is a high energy tissue, okay? It's beating 24-7 all the time, all the time, all right? And the most effective way for it to get energy is through what we call aerobic cellular respiration or metabolism. That means we need oxygen. We need oxygen. Where do we get our oxygen from? Obviously from the air, but from oxygenated blood, from red blood cells, okay? So if you're not getting blood, you're not getting oxygen, okay? So that's why our cardiac muscle, right, has a huge blood supply. It's going to have hundreds of mitochondria inside. Does anyone here know what myoglobin is? You know what hemoglobin is, right? Right? I hope. <laughs> hemoglobin is what? Yeah, that's right. Yes, that's exactly right, Hannah. All right, myoglobin, myo is muscle. That is the muscle's version of hemoglobin. Okay? And so, and you probably don't remember the creatine kinase pathway, but I'm going to uh, show you. All right? You have ADP floating around in the cytosol. Okay, and then you have what's known as creatine phosphate. All right, so what will happen is this creatine kinase, all right, is going to, this enzyme here, kinase is an enzyme that likes to take phosphate and stick it onto things. 
So what creatine kinase does is it takes the phosphate here off of our creatine phosphate and it sticks it onto this molecule, the ADP, and it gives us ATP. And then we're just left with creatine hanging out, okay? So myoglobin and creatine kinase, all right, are going to be two things that are going to help with energy production, okay? If you look here, I mean, your heart has a huge variety, a huge variety of fuel sources, which is good. It's very good, okay? But some are better than others, right? Fatty acids are, that's why they're listed here first. They're the best, okay? You get the most bang for your buck with fatty acids. So we prefer what's called beta oxidation, which is when we break down fatty acids and we'll get tons of ATP. But if not, no problem. We got glucose. Glucose is good also, okay? Lactic acid, nah. Starting to get a little bit worrisome here, not the best. Amino acids, pretty good, but still not the best. When you're down to ketone bodies, you know, that's like the drug addict uh, sniffing formaldehyde, all right? They're in, 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 they're, they're in rock bottom, okay? So keep that in mind. We prefer fatty acid. That's good, okay? Glucose, another one. But it all comes down to here, all right, to the aerobic cellular respiration. And in order for that to occur, you need oxygen, okay? You need it. You need it, you need it, because that's the gateway into the mitochondria, remember? Right? If you have oxygen, then we can take our energy-producing process into the mitochondria, and instead of getting two ATP for one glucose molecule, now we can get 32. And all you need is oxygen. And for that to happen, we need to have good blood flow, okay? So usually what happens when someone has a myocardial infarction, they reduce their blood flow. Blockage, coronary artery blockage is a great way to get reduced blood flow. And when you get reduced blood flow and yet the tissue keeps requiring all right, oxygen all right, and blood and it's not getting it, what happens to the tissue? Tissue doesn't get its nutrients. What happens if you don't eat or drink for a year? You die, okay? Well, that's what happens here, okay? You need your nutrients. Well, guess what? Your tissues need nutrients also. So what happens, all right? It becomes ischemic, and that term is when we have low oxygen, and then we get cell death. Cell death is called apoptosis. Tissue death is called necrosis. You get tissue necrosis, all right? And it can become permanent. And that's what will happen if you have a heart attack. So permanent tissue. Here we go. Let's do some labeling. All right. So run it through here. Okay. This is an internal view. All right. This is the right side of your heart. This is the left side of your heart. Here's the superior vena cava. Okay. Coming in. Down here, this opening down here is the inferior vena cava. Okay. Then you can see over here, you have this little opening. That's the opening to the coronary sinus. So the coronary sinus is where all the venous blood from your heart drains into that structure, and then it drains into the right atrium. Superior vena cava, opening to the inferior vena cava. This separation between the two atria is the interatrial septum. And then this little thumbprint structure right here on the septal wall is known as the fossa ovalis. When you're inside your mommy, it's known as the foramen ovale because it's a hole. All right, it allows for mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. So blood will move across that hole. But as soon as you're born and you take your first breath, that closes up. Pretty cool. And it closes up because of prostacyclins, which we just talked about. Pretty neat. Okay? All right, um, four. All right, that's the right atrium there. Opening to, okay, opening to that. What are we looking at? Six. All right, here is your right atrial ventricular valve here, also known as the tricuspid valve. That means there's three cusps or leaflets to it, okay? Then we can see that we have these white cords that are attached to that. That's the chordae tendinae. And those chordae tendinae 
attached to the papillary muscles down in the ventricle. And that is there to help prevent, all right, the atrial ventricular valves from opening up when the ventricles contract, okay? Here is our left atrium, and then you can see part of your uh, left atrial ventricular valve, also known as the bicuspid valve, because there's only two cusps to it, and you can also call it the mitral valve. That's several choices of what you want to call that valve, okay? All right, this next slide is going to be the exact same version of this slide, okay? It's just moved around. It's a little bit messier. Okay, so the exact same version. Okay, so when we're talking about our blood vessels of the heart, those are our coronary vessels, okay? And same thing that we already knew, all right? Coronary arteries are going to carry oxygenated blood, right, from the heart itself, from the inside, specifically from, it's going to go, as blood is moving from the left ventricle out into the aorta, there's openings on the other side of that aortic semilunar valve, okay? And so it'll flow from the aorta out to the heart, okay? So the coronary arteries are going to take oxygenated blood to the heart wall, all right? The veins, all right, are going to take deoxygenated blood, all right, from the heart wall back to the right atrium. You need to know that. All right, so the right atrium essentially gets, all right, the deoxygenated blood from the body. That includes the heart also. Okay. Questions so far? No? Okay. Can I? Yeah. Why? <laughs> Is that a way just so I won't talk so you can write that stuff down? I knew it. But that's a good way to slow me down. If you told me to take a breath mint, then I'd be uh, yeah, upset. What? I know. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, almost done with coronary circulation, but. Let's just quickly talk about some of the blood supply here, all right? We've labeled some of it, but then we're gonna finish labeling it after these uh, couple of slides here. So let's start off with arterial blood flow, okay? So your right and left coronary arteries are going to come off of your aorta, specifically the ascending aorta. So as the, the blood leaves the heart, it goes into the ascending aorta, then you have the arch of the aorta, and then you get the descending thoracic aorta. Okay, so this short little tiny spot here, a short little stretch, that's the ascending aorta. Okay, so if you see, sorry to do this to you folks. There you go. All right, right here. You see something like this, but one of the models from your atlas, and it's pointing to this part of the aorta. That's the ascending aorta. This is the arch of the aorta, and then way over here and back here. That's the descending thoracic aorta, okay? Some people call it the descending aorta. I want to be as specific as possible with you. If it's going down and it's in the thoracic cavity, it's the descending thoracic aorta. When it pierces through the diaphragm and then it's in your abdominal cavity, then it's known as the descending abdominal aorta. Sometimes people just call it the, the abdominal aorta, but I'm just trying to be as specific with you as possible. If I say descending abdominal aorta, you know where I'm at, that I'm below the diaphragm, okay? If I say descending thoracic aorta, you're like, oh, he's in the, in the rib cage, all right, above the diaphragm, okay? I'm just trying to be specific. Okay, so we're good on that. The right and left coronary arteries come off of the ascending aorta, and we're going to find them in the coronary sulcus. That's that little... Uh, space in between the atrium and the ventricles. That's the coronary sulcus there, okay? So when we talk about the right coronary artery, okay, so this is going ahead towards the right side of the heart. 
we have the right marginal artery. We want to know where it supplies. The right marginal artery is going to supply that whole right heart border there. Okay. The po and then the other branch that comes off is the posterior interventricular artery. Okay. That's going to sit in the posterior interventricular sulcus. Remember with the middle cardiac vein, okay, on the back side of the heart. And that, this is important, it's going to supply the back of both left and right ventricles. That's a lot. Okay, that's a lot. But it's not as much as the Widowmaker. You probably think of the Widowmaker. We're going to see that in a second here. All right, so that's the branches that come off the right coronary artery. The other uh, coronary artery, the left, okay, it has two branches. Okay, the first one here is the circumflex artery. The circumflex artery supplies the left atrium and the left ventricle. So that seems like a lot, right? Well, guess what? The anterior interventricular artery, okay, is going to supply the front of both the ventricles, and this is the big one, most of the interventricular septum. That's why this artery is called the widowmaker, okay? Because if you block it or if it ruptures, right, it supplies a majority of the muscular tissue to the ventricles and the tissue between the ventricles, the interventricular septum. So you damage that and you get that tissue ischemia there, you're close to being dead, all right? Now, I've had a patient that had 95% blockage in that. I don't know how that person was living. But they got, it was found, and then they, they stented him. But um, he was very close. And he had no symptoms whatsoever. None. The only thing that he complained about, which led him to go into the hospital because he listened to his wife, um, was uh, shortness of breath. And not a lot. Not like he couldn't catch his breath. It was just slight shortness of breath, and that was it. But nothing else. Like, no chest pain, none of that stuff. It was amazing. Told me he was very lucky. All right, so left coronary artery, circumflex artery, anterior interventricular artery. Those are the two. So we're going to use this model here. Okay, so here's the aorta. Okay, here's the right coronary artery coming off, and it's going into, this is the uh, coronary sulcus, that groove there. Okay, and it gives off, all right, this first artery, and it sits kind of like here on the bottom portion, or what we call the right margin of the heart, right here, this one. So that's the right marginal artery. Okay, and then we, we, we continue on with the right coronary artery here going back, and then it drops down here in the back. Right here. And that's going to go in between the left and the right ventricle in that little uh, posterior interventricular sulcus. And then that is known as the posterior interventricular artery. It's on the back side. So going back up to the ascending neural order, now we've got our left coronary artery. It comes out and it's going to sit in the coronary sulcus and it's going to give off two branches. Okay. One that's going to kind of stay on the left side here, that's the circumflex artery. That's this guy right here. And then this major one right here, that is the anterior interventricular uh, artery. And that sits in the anterior interventricular sulcus. And that's going to be with the great cardiac vein. And we'll see that here in a moment. Okay. All right. Those are our coronary arteries. All right. Now, when we talk about the end arteries, I'm sure, have you folks ever heard of an, an anastomosis? It's like when blood vessels make little connections with one another. Okay, and that's what an anastomosis is. And we'll see that, all right, um, we could, and those are referred to as structural anastomosis, like a physical connection from one blood vessel to the next, all right? And so, it's not, has anyone ever talked to somebody that's had heart blockage and they're like, the doctor went in there and they found the, these, these connections in there. I hear it all the time. Well, that's what your body's going to do. When you start to get blockages, all right, these blood vessels are going to undergo what's called neovascularization. They're going to want to make connections with other existing non-blocked blood vessels. And that's what will happen here. 
All right, but here's the problem. In our coronary circulation, if they make anastomoses, it's, it's not enough, okay? It's what we refer to as insignificant. Okay, it's just not enough. Your venture, it's, it's not enough to, to head, head the, um, the situation off at the pass there, okay? Um, so we're not going to really see, all right, and if you hear about it, that's a, that's a rarity, that there was an anastomosis that really made uh, a, a big difference there. But this is the part that I really want to get to, the blood flow here, okay? One thing you have to understand, all right, when your heart contracts and relaxes, that's how it pumps blood in the coronary blood system, okay? So when the heart contracts, all right, it compresses, the blood vessels, okay, it squishes them. So no blood will flow during that part. It's when the heart relaxes, that's when the blood vessels are patent. And when they're patent, when they're opened up, okay, that's when blood can flow through, okay? So during the filling process of the heart, that's when blood is flowing through those blood vessels, okay? But when it contracts, it squeezes those blood vessels, so the blood doesn't flow at that point, it's interrupted, but it'll squeeze it through the blood vessels, okay? So the whole point is the flow of blood to your heart is what we call intermittent. It's on, it's off, okay? So it's not in constant motion, okay? On and off. I feel like the air conditioning is on in here. I don't know why it's cold here, and I don't normally get cold. All right, I, I swear to you, I don't know why it's doing that. Because it's certainly not hot over there. <laughs> I think it might be even hotter in the hallway than it is in here. Okay, you folks good with that? Okay, all right, cool, cool, cool. All right, let's do the coronary veins, and then we'll do some labeling here, okay? All right, so as we know, arteries are going to bring blood, all right, oxygenated blood, from the heart to the heart wall, all right? Our veins are going to bring deoxygenated blood from the heart wall to the right atrium, okay? So the great cardiac vein, and I just, this is how I remember it. Um, the great cardiac vein is paired up with the anterior interventricular vein or, or artery. And to me, the anterior interventricular artery is the most important artery. Because if you mess that one up, then you're going to be dead, okay? Call it the Widowmaker. So you got to be a big deal to be in the same area as this artery. So this vein is called the Great Vein. Big deal to be there, okay? So then on the back side of our heart, we have our posterior interventricular artery, okay? So although the posterior interventricular artery is not as important as the anterior interventricular artery, it's still important, okay? So the vein that's going to be associated with that, it's kind of middle of the road. It's like, yeah, it's okay, but it's still, you know, it, it has its role. And then if you are described as being a marginal person, you take that as a compliment. Wouldn't you rather be described as an exceptional person? So if someone describes me as marginal, then I kind of feel small, all right? So the right marginal artery and the small cardiac vein are going to be associated with one another, okay? And then on the back side of your heart, all right, where all these veins drain into, that's the coronary sinus, all right? And the coronary sinus is then going to drain all the blood into our right atrium. Coronary sinus is found on the back of the heart, all right, in the coronary sulcus that groove in between the atria and the ventricles. All right. So kind of work on memorizing these pairs. All right, great cardiac vein, all right, anterior interventricular artery, okay? Small cardiac vein, right marginal artery, okay? So we'll just work on those. And here you can see in our drawing. All right, so here's our coronary sinus. So all the veins will eventually drain into that. So again, same view. This is uh, on the, the anterior interventricular sulcus here. So here's the great cardiac vein. It's going to circle around and drain into the coronary sinus here. 
Here's our, all right, our, the small cardiac vein, which is going to be, you can't really see it very well, but this is the right marginal artery right here. It's not colored. Okay, so they're going to be together. And then on the back side here is the middle cardiac vein. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you, I had a horrible, I'm glad I was going over my slides today because I had a, a horrible <clears throat> uh, slide version. I actually left it in the slideshow. It was this one here. This was just awful. There's stuff on here that's not even labeled. <laughs> this is way better. Okay. So again, we're looking at the left side of the heart. So when I say the left side of the heart, we should be seeing all right, the left ventricle and the left atrium predominantly. Okay. So here again, on the top, coming in, there's the superior vena cava, right? And then we can see two of our left pulmonary veins draining into the left atrium here, all right? And then at the same time, you can't really see where it originated from, but you can see a little bit of it. This guy right here, all right, here is our circumflex artery here, okay? Do you remember which coronary artery the circumflex artery comes off of? You get a 50-50 chance of getting it right because there's only two coronary arteries that come off of the ascending aorta. Comes off the left, the left coronary artery, okay? The circumflex artery comes off the left coronary artery, okay? And then you can see here, wrapping around, all right, in the coronary sulcus here, there's our great cardiac vein. You can see a little bit of it here. Okay, here it is, here it is, here it is here. Great cardiac vein. Then our left ventricle here, and this wrinkly thing, that's the left oracle that comes off of what? What is the left oracle attached to? Part of. Left atrium, left atrium. I felt like that was like too easy. I, know. I, I know people feel like that, but trust me, it's okay if you get it wrong here. You'll never forget it. All right, wait, let me go back. Good so far? Okay. Okay. So now what we're going to do, I want to skip this one. It's the same slide. It's just messed up the labeling. Now we're going to flip the heart over. Now we're going to look at it from the right side. Okay. So same thing we can still see. We can see still see our superior vena cava. All right, but now we're going to see mainly the right ventricle and the right atrium, okay? So here's our right oracle, which is part of the right atrium here, okay? All right, but now let's look at the blood vessels that we can see here, okay? You see, now these are just called marginal arteries. Here's one over here. Here's one over here, okay? Those are our, our, our marginal arteries. Those are just smaller arteries, not to be confused with the right marginal artery, okay? So looking here, all right, you can see, we, again, we can't see its origin, but we can see here's the right coronary artery, and it's located in the, in, in the coronary sulcus. Now, you don't have to say right coronary artery in the coronary sulcus, okay? Remember, if it's asking for the artery, it'll tell you, it'll give you some sort of indication, right? Okay, that's where it sits. So our right coronary artery divides into our right marginal artery and then our posterior interventricular artery. Okay, so this one right here, this big guy right here, I don't think it's labeled on here. That one right there. That is going to be, you should label this, the right marginal artery. Wait a minute, hold on one second. Give me a second. Yep, 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 okay, yep, yep. I had myself worried there. Okay, that's the right marginal. All right, questions so far? Okay. All right, yeah, that's the messed up version. Oh, 
What time is it? Okay. I want to go through, I want to start off a little bit on the cardiac cycle. I really enjoy talking about the cardiac cycle. Um, that's just me. Okay. I really do because I think it's really kind of neat how it functions and how it works. And But besides the point, I'm hoping, you know, I will go over this again, but I want to just kind of give you just a brief introduction and then, I'll, and then um, we'll call it quits for the evening. But I just want to go over it. Uh, some of the, the overall, the overview of the cardiac cycle, okay? So, first of all, folks are familiar with the sounds that the heart makes, right? Loved up. You've probably heard that before. Loved up. That's a, that's a heart. Never, no one's ever heard of loved up? No? Never? Loved up? Okay. Anyways, like if you've ever listened through a stethoscope, the heart, you know, it makes two beats. Boom, 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 boom. Well, then you would call that the loved up, right? That's a, that's a cardiac cycle. That's how fast it is, all right? It's boom, boom, all right? So this is basically, when we talk about a cardiac cycle, we're going to talk about everything that occurs, all right, from the start of a heartbeat, all right, to the start of the following heartbeat. So that means we have to fill the heart, all right, then we have to empty the heart, then we got to fill it again, then we got to empty it again. So you're going to be amazed, all right, just how much stuff occurs during that process. So we got to do a couple definitions here. The first is when the heart contracts, we call that systole. You need to commit that to memory. And when the heart relaxes, that's diastole. Okay? So when the heart contracts, that's systole. When it relaxes, that's diastole. Like you ever seen, um, seen. when you get your uh, blood pressure taken, there's two numbers they give you, top and bottom numbers, what most people are familiar familiar with. The top number is the systole. That's when your heart contracts. That's why it's always a, hard, a higher number. All right. What's the normal? What's your normal blood pressure? 120 over 80. And that top number is how much pressure in, in, in milligrams of mercury, all right, that the heart contracts. Okay. So that's 120. Okay. That's systole. That's when it's contracting. Diastole is when it's relaxed. Okay. Okay, so this is huge. That's why it's in bold letters. When the heart contracts, it increases pressure. Commit that to memory right now. If you're going to ignore everything else I say today, don't ignore this. Okay? When it relaxes, it decreases the pressure. So if you keep your mouth closed and you puff out your cheeks, you're increasing the pressure inside your mouth, all right? And then when I let the pre when I let the air out, it relaxes it, and so the pressure decreases. Similar type of concept, okay? So puffing out your cheeks is very similar. So we all remember diffusion, right? We have it something in an area of high concentration, and the same something in an area of low concentration. And so we'll say things want to diffuse down their concentration gradient. Well, now we're going to deal with what's called a pressure gradient, okay? A pressure gradient is when we have, in this situation, blood is going to be our something. It's going to move down its pressure gradient, meaning it's going to go from an area of high pressure to low pressure, okay? So high pressure to low pressure. And then finally, we can't talk about the heart and not talk, talk about these guys, the valves. They make sure that blood goes in one direction, in one direction only. All right? You can't have it going backwards. That defeats the purpose. Okay? So it's always forward, forward, forward. So when we close these valves, it prevents blood from going backwards. Okay? We good so far. So the three things, all these, all, well, all this stuff on this slide is really, really important, all right, is this one here, all right, contraction increases pressure, relaxation decreases it, okay? Blood is going to move down its pressure gradient, goes from an area of high pressure to low pressure, okay? And then finally, all right, our valves are going to make sure that blood goes in one direction only, forward, onward, ever forward into the night, okay? That's what it does. All right, good. So 
A couple things that we really want to discuss here that's really important. When we talk about the cardiac cycle, the ventricles play the largest role. Okay? So we say that they have the most important driving force. All right. Atria play a role too. But basically, the atria's job is to fill the ventricles. Okay? And so the ventricles are going to push the blood out of the heart. <clears throat> All right? So whatever's going on with the ventricles is really going to be of crucial importance for our understanding of how the heart beats, how it works, how blood moves in and out of the heart. Okay? Okay. So... When I say ventricular contraction, you should be thinking ventricular systole, right? Remember systole is when the heart contracts, okay? So when we start to contract the muscle, if you start to fill your cheeks and your mouth up with air while keeping your mouth closed, the air is going to put more pressure on your cheeks. So when the ventricles contract, they're going to increase the ventricular pressure. Okay. So when the ventricles contract, they're going to move blood out of the heart. So if the atrial ventricular valves were open, that's the valve in between the atria and the ventricles, all right, and the ventricles contracted, wouldn't that push blood into the atria if those valves were open? So don't we want the AV valves closed so it can push blood out of the heart, not back up into the atria, right? We don't want that. That's bad. Do I have a heart picture here? I don't. Oh, I don't. All right, so that's what I'm looking at here. Okay. Here is the atria, okay? Right atria, left atria. So if when these contract, all right, we want to move the blood out of the heart. We don't want to push it back into the atria, okay? So the AV valves have to be closed. They have to be closed when the ventricles contract, okay? Memorize that. I hate to just say leave it up to memorization, but you have to. Okay, so when the ventricles are contracting, the AV valves are closed. And then as pressure increases, all right, remember our pressure inside the ventricles increase, they're going to push the semilunar valves, those are the valves that lead towards the pulmonary trunk and the aorta, they're going to push those open. And we're going to move blood into those blood vessels there. Okay, I'm going to break this down step by step by step, so don't worry about it right now. Okay, so after muscle contracts, doesn't it have to relax? Didn't we learn that in 210? Do you have a magic school lesson? <laughs> you know what, dude? I bet you there's one out there. And I have a really, uh, I had a really good video, I got to look for it, um, that explains the heart cycle within like five minutes. It's awesome really cool to watch and I'll, I'll look for it and uh, I'll, I'll throw it up there for you guys for next class. All right, so now the ventricles are relaxed. We pump the blood out of the heart. Now we got to relax everything, okay? So when it relaxes, we're going to lower the pressure inside the ventricles. So as it's relaxing, all right, the pressure becomes less inside the ventricles than in the blood vessels, the pulmonary trunk in the aorta, and so the semilunar valves close, okay? And then what will happen is the AV valves will open because we got rid of all the blood and the pressure is really low inside the ventricles. We'll go through this, okay? So for right now, what I would say is just memorize ventricular contraction. AV valves close, semilunar valves get pushed open. Ventricular relaxation, the semilunar valves will close and the AV valves will open. Okay, so the opposite. Okay, opposite. 
And I'll explain to you why all that happened. So let's start off at the beginning of the cardiac cycle. In the beginning, all of the chambers are resting. No muscle contraction whatsoever. So what happens here? We get filling. We're going to start filling our heart up because we just pumped all the blood out of it, or most of the blood. Okay? So all the chambers are resting. Blood flows into the atria first and then into the ventricles. Okay? So the blood enters the atria and the AV valves are open. Because remember, ventricular relaxation, the AV valves are open. So the blood literally, if this is our heart, kind of like this, all right, and the AV valves are open, all right, and blood starts to pour into the heart, it's going to go right into the ventricle, okay? Now, eventually, as blood starts to fill the ventricles up, much like a water balloon, when you're filling it with water, all right, the water pressure starts to push on the walls of the balloon well the blood is going to start to push and build up the pressure inside the ventricles okay but as long as the pressure in the ventricles is less than the pressure inside the atria then the av valves will stay open okay now during this time as we're filling up the ventricles the semilunar valves are closed right because we don't want blood coming back in from the aorta or the pulmonary trunk that has to stay closed right now because we've got to fill the, the heart up again before we shoot more blood out of it okay so we can say now that the pressure in the ventricles is less than the pressure in what we call the arterial trunk or the aorta and the pulmonary trunk okay because wherever pressure is greater all right remember the valves are one way they can only oh the av valves can only open into the ventricles and the semilunar valves can only open into the blood vessels the great vessels okay if the pressure is greater in the great vessels than in the ventricles it keeps the the, um, the valves closed the semilunar valves closed and same here in our atria. If the atrial pressure is greater than the ventricular pressure, right here, then that will keep the AV valves open because there's more pressure in the atria pushing those valves open. Okay. Okay. So here's what happens now the ventricles start to fill up. Now the atria are going to start to contract. Okay, and as they contract, they're going to push more blood into the ventricles. It's like that last little bit of extra blood. Like we're just going to get a little bit more blood into the ventricles. How do I do that? I'm going to squeeze the atria, all right, and we're going to push that blood into that extra blood into the ventricles. So how does that happen? Well, our, the electrical system of our heart, the conduction system of our heart has a pacemaker. That's this guy right here, the SA node, okay? The SA node starts to depolarize and it starts to stimulate both atria to start to contract. We'll get into the details in, in lecture, so don't worry about that right now, right? If you don't understand what I'm saying, okay? So the atria start to contract. They push whatever blood is in the atria into the ventricles, okay? And we have a name for that blood that's in the ventricles at that point. As the atria start to contract, right, that is known as the end diastolic volume. You need to know that. E D V, end diastolic volume. So that is the volume of blood. And it could be between 140 milliliters to 130 milliliters, all right, that will be in the ventricles. Okay, at the, um, at the, well, how do I want to say this? At atrial contraction. Okay, as the atria squeeze out that last bit and push it into the ventricles, all right, that is going to be the volume of blood in the ventricles as the atria contract. Okay, 
So at this point, from here on out, we don't talk about the atria anymore. Why? Because they're relaxing and they're not doing anything. We're done. That was it. We only had one phase of the cycle to talk about the atria, and that's it. So for the rest of the cardiac cycle, it's not important. That's why the ventricles are the main driving force for the cardiac cycle. Okay? All right. So this term here that you see below, isovolumetric. Iso means to remain the same. So what that term is telling you, isovolumetric, means that the volume doesn't change. Okay, during this phase here, this part, when we have isovolumetric contraction, all right, what's going to happen is the ventricles are going to start to contract, but the volume of blood inside the ventricles does not change. Okay, so Purkinje fibers, what are those? For right now, those are part of our conduction system, and they sit right in the interventricular septum. Okay, so they're just sending the electrical signal and it's going to start to cause the, the cardiac muscle cells to depolarize and they'll start to contract. Okay, so we start to excite the cardiac cells in the ventricular region of the heart. So they'll start to contract. All right, and as they start to contract, remember what we said, ventricular contraction increases pressure. And what will happen is the pressure inside the ventricles becomes greater than the pressure in the atria. So that causes the AV valves to slam shut. Okay? That prevents blood from backflowing. Won't go back up into the atria. It's only got one place to go. Okay? So again, this phase here, our, our ventricular pressure starts to increase, but it's still less, right? Than the pressure in the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So we can't get those valves open yet. Okay, that's like if I'm standing on the outside of the room and two or three of you are on the inside of the room and I'm trying to push the door open and the three of you are pushing the door closed, I, I'm not, and the door doesn't move, all right, I'm not exerting enough pressure to open up the door. Okay, because what the force that you guys are pushing on the door is greater than what I'm able to. And that's what's going on here. The pressure outside the heart is more than the pressure inside the ventricles yet. So the semilunar valves will stay closed. It won't open yet, okay? So now we get to this stage here, this phase, ventricular ejection. Well, look, you can see from that term there, ejection, we're going to be ejecting something out of somewhere. So we're going to move blood out of the heart in this phase, okay? So here's what happens. Those ventricles keep contracting, all right, and we keep increasing the pressure, and eventually it becomes greater than the arterial pressure in the aorta and in the pulmonary trunk. And when that happens, when the ventricular pressure becomes greater than the arterial pressure, then the valves open up. They're forced open. And then blood leaves the heart and it moves out into all right, the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So the amount of blood, this is an important term, the amount of blood that leaves the heart, all right, mainly the left ventricle, is called the stroke volume. Okay? And the amount of blood that's left in the ventricles, because it doesn't pump it all out, the amount of blood that's left over is called the end systolic volume. So you can see there's an equation down here. ESV equals end diastolic volume minus stroke volume. There's an easy way to, to calculate out stroke volume. And in order to do that, you just basically... Subtract the end diastolic volume, excuse me, you subtract the end systolic volume from the end diastolic volume. So here's the, if the end diastolic volume is 100, what's the value they're giving up there? 130 milliliters. So 130 milliliters 
minus uh, end systolic volume, which is 60, all right, that equals 70. Okay, and you can mess around with the equation. The example here, we're calculating out end systolic volume, all right? All, to do that, you just subtract the stroke volume from the end diastolic volume. This is the one that I encourage oops, most people to use because you'll you'll see it. But you need to know you need to know both. Okay, stroke volume. It should be on that equation sheet too. Okay, that I said. Did anyone get that equation sheet that I sent out? Okay. You're not responsible for any of that stuff on the first test, because it's not on the first test. But on two, three, four, and two, three, four, and five lecture tests, um, there'll be a some of that material you'll be responsible for. So keep that sheet handy. If you, uh, if you don't have it handy, maybe print it out. Um, all right. Okay, so after we squirt the blood out, okay, now what happens, at the, remember, after a contraction, we always have to have relaxation. So now we're gonna have what's called isovolumetric relaxation, which means none of the volume in the heart will change. Okay, so as the ventricles start to relax, okay, we will start to see the pressure lower inside of them, okay. At this point, the pressure outside the heart, the arterial pressure from the aorta and in the pulmonary trunk is going to be greater than the ventricular pressure. Well, that causes the semilunar valves to close. In addition, to some of the blood that left the heart, it starts to slide backwards. And it gets caught up in the soup ladle uh, configuration of those uh, valves and helps to pull them closed. So there's two things that help with the closing of the semilunar valves. As the blood starts to backslide, right, towards the ventricles, it pulls on the uh, heart valves and pulls those closed, but also the fact that the pressure is greater outside the heart in the arterial uh, uh, blood vessels there, the, the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, right, is greater outside than the ventricular pressure causes those to close. So the AV valves are still closed. So all the heart valves are closed at this point, isovolumetric relaxation, okay? So obviously, if all the valves are closed, all right, we are going to see no more blood entering into the ventricles. Hence, that's why it's called isovolumetric. Volume doesn't change. Okay. And we'll talk about a little bit what's going on with the atria because the atria had been filling up a little bit during this time. Okay. It's like, wait, what? The atria are actually doing something? Yes, they are. Okay. Because during this time, they're filling up to let in, once the AV valves open up, they're going to put their blood back in the ventricles. Okay, so this is isovolumetric relaxation. All right, the AV valves are still closed, the semilunar valves closed, all the valves are closed. All right, and then finally, I think this is the last one. Yep, good. I'm gonna finish up with this slide here, then we'll call it a night. We get atrial relaxation and what we call ventricular filling. So at this point, all the valves are closed, okay? So the ventricles have relaxed now completely. The atria are relaxed, okay? The ventricles are gonna relax so much, okay, that during this time, the atria have been filling up with blood. So the pressure inside the atria has now become greater than the pressure in the ventricles, and that forces the AV valves to open up, and then blood will dump directly into the ventricles. And this, is the start of the next phase. We get that passive filling, all right? Blood will continue to flow into the atria, but the AV valves are open, so the blood will continue to fill up the ventricles. But the semilunar valves are still closed because the pressure outside the heart is greater than the ventricular pressure. So if, don't worry if you don't have a good grasp on this because on Wednesday, I'm going to go through these pictures in your book and it'll explain it a little bit better. Okay. All right. Is there any questions for me? I know it's a lot. You just want to fill your brains now with stuff for the test. I got it. I got it. I got it. All right. I wish you luck. 
right? Remember, if there's any issues with the test, contact honor lock first if it's an honor lock situation. Yes, ma'am. So I've never taken a test where it's been timed like that. So I only have one minute for a question, not to mention it's a test. Yeah. Oh, so if the question yeah. is 75, Correct. 75 questions, you have 75 minutes. So Overall, yep, yep, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you want to sit around. If you answer a question, you can move on to the next question, and you know you, you don't lose any time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I got that. Okay. All righty. Good luck to everybody. Make sure that you please sign in for me if you haven't already. Yeah.